Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Jay Alomar. Uh, I work in venture capital. I'm a software engineer by training. The last five years, I've been trying to learn as much as I can about machine learning. And I found the best way for me to learn was to write and try to explain concepts. And some of that writing seemed to, to, to echo with people. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the times when I read about machine learning, it, it, I feel that it's a little intimidating to me. Um, and I find that this is the experience of a lot of other people as well. Um, and so I've, over the last five years, I've been trying to break down concepts into um, narratives that don't require that you become an expert in calculus or statistics or even programming. Um, because I think sometimes just grabbing some of the underlying intuitions can help you build confidence to continue learning about, about the topic that you, that you want. Um, it's a stretch to say you'll learn everything you need to know about machine learning and deep learning in, in this session. Uh, but what I aim to do is give you some of the main key concepts that you will come across as you dive deeper in, into machine learning. Um, that will guide your way a little bit. So, so they'll you know, illuminate their way stations um, on your way to, to, to the top of, of this mountain that we can call uh, machine learning or, and deep learning. So why, why learn about machine learning? Uh, for me, the first reason is that it's super interesting. And one of the best demos um, that I can use to, to showcase this idea is this tech demo of a product that came out. This is a video that came out in 2010. I'd been working as a software person for, for 10 years when this came out, and it blew me out of the water, absolutely. I did not know technology was able to do something like this. So this is an app that came out in 2010. So you get the idea. This is probably the most impressive tech demo I've seen in, in all of my life. And I did not know technology was able to do that at that point. This is running offline on an iPhone 4, not connected to the internet. It was doing all this image processing and machine translation on the device. These are wizards. These are gods who, who, who create stuff like this. And so when I saw this, I was like, I did not study any machine learning in college. I, you know, Whenever the next chance comes by where I can start to learn about machine learning, I will, I will do that. And that came in 2015 when TensorFlow was open source, and I was like, OK, this is the time for me to do it. Language um, is one of the most interesting um, applications that I, uh, that I feel about, about machine learning. And I talk a lot about them. But then I want to show you this other demo that came out one month ago that's an extension to this. So this was an app called WordLens. Google bought this company they lumped the team into Google Translate. And this evolved, you can say, into this um, feature of Google Assistant called interpreter mode. Hi there. How can I help you? Hola. ¿Habla español? Sorry, I only speak English, but you can select the language you speak. Español. Hey, Google. Be my interpreter. What language should I interpret to? Spanish. Okay, go ahead. How can I help you? ¿Cómo puedo ayudarte? Estoy buscando un lugar para almorzar antes de ir al aeropuerto. I'm looking for a place to have lunch before going to the airport. What would you like? ¿Qué te gustaría? Quizás una pizza o una ensalada. Pizza or salad. There's a great place around the corner. You can take the train from there to the airport. Hay un buen lugar a la vuelta de la esquina. Puedes tomar el tren. You get the idea, the video goes for another 20 seconds. 
Uh, but then two ideas from, from science fiction come, come to my mind when I see something like this. First is the Arthur C. Clarke quote of technology that is sufficiently advanced enough seem indistinguishable from magic. And this, to me, seems, feels like magic. Um, and then if you've uh, watched or read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there's this babble fish t future technology where you insert this fish into your ear and it translates, and we have a live feature uh, demonstrating that. So machine learning is super interesting and exciting, but it's also very important. It's going to change how every one of us, how our, our relatives, our coworkers do their jobs. Um, automation is happening on a, on a large scale, and it's only going to happen more and more in the future. And so for me, this was a, a guiding uh, one of the motivations to be on the forefront and really understand what happens there, because this will have a direct um, impact on my livelihood and the livelihoods um, around everybody in, in, uh, around me, I guess. So in, in venture capital, this is one of the main slides or, or, or ideas that, that uh, factor in, into the saying that software is eating the world. This is a figure of the largest 20 companies in the US in 1995, where the largest company is at 100%, and then the, you have the next 20, uh, next 19. At that time, there were only two technology companies, two software companies, Wintel. Microsoft and Intel, you can see them in the center here. 20 years later, technology and software companies became the, by the, you know, the, the leading five um, are technology companies. These are GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. And then you still have um, Intel there, but then every other company is also working on, on software and developing software. Uh, so software is eating the world and machine learning is, is, is um, the latest, let's say, suite of methods that enable software to, to eat the world and eat every industry. Jobs uh, over the years have disappeared. We used to get into an elevator. There was a person who would, who would drive that elevator. No more. There were uh, suites and offices and floors of, of people and accountants and clerks um, that you know, their jobs are now automated by just a, 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 a spreadsheet. He used to be, you have to talk to a person to, to talk to somebody over the phone. You don't need to do that anymore. So technology, before, even before machine learning, has been automating and changing the, the nature of jobs. But that's not always negative. There are jobs that were never meant to be for humans. So there, there are positive implications here as well. So when I was... Uh, when I wanted to learn machine learning, machine learning has so many different applications. You can spend an entire lifetime learning about machine learning and not uh, find, or find something that uh, gives you that much practicality in the, in the real world. So I wanted applications that are, um, have some uh, relation to, to, to commerce, I guess. And so these are the things that would have business applications. What I asked, what are the machine learning applications that have the most commercial uh, uh, applications, let's say? Or this is using dollar amount as proxy for how important a method is. And I can tell you that after, after looking into it myself uh, for a while, I think this is something a lot of you have probably found, is there is one application of machine learning that we can say is uh, the most commonly used application in machine learning in all of commercial uh, applications. And that is the concept of prediction. So we can think of prediction, we can think about it as a model that takes in a, a numeric input and cr spits out, gives out a, a prediction, uh, another number. So we can think of this as just a, a simple machine learning model. And that is our first concept. So we, we're going to run through about 10 concepts. So prediction, and I call it different names here, estimating and calculating, because this kind of prediction does not always have to be about things in the future. We just use that word prediction, but you can interchangeably use estimation or, or calculation. So predicting values based on patterns in other existing values is the most commonly used application of machine learning in practice. So that's easy. So I had a quote that I mentioned about magic, but machine learning is not magic. 
Let's, let's um, look at a, an, an example. Let's say three people walk into an ice cream shop. How much would they pay? How much would their collective tab be? This is the kind of question that you will not find an answer to in, in, in a business book. But one way we can try to solve this is by looking at data. And the way to look at it in data, we say, okay, let's look at the last three purchases. How many groups were in each of these? How many, how many people were in each of these groups and how much did they pay? So we had a group of one person who paid $10 for ice cream. We had a group of two people who paid $20 for ice cream. We had a group of four people who paid 40. Now, we have never seen any group of three people. Can we tell, is there something we can learn from this data set that can give us uh, some sort of answer for, for three? So how much, would that, how much would that be? 30, yes, perfect, thank you. So that is, the basic idea behind all the hype of machine learning, that thing that you intuitively did just now. But let's just put some, some names on it. What you did is you found a number, a magical number that maps the relationship between these two columns. And then you used it to make predictions using this feature. So this is our, our lingo, and this is language that we can use from the simplest prediction model up to Google Translate and, and Siri and Alexa. So the, the first column, the, the green column, is, is the list of features. And then we have labels, which are, correspond to the value that we want to predict. This is called a labeled data set. And this is called a weight. So this is probably one of the simplest prediction models. This is also the most, simp this is the most simple neural network. So it's a neural network of one weight. 10, that just multiplies um, the feature and outputs it, its prediction. We can think about this model as looking like this. So spit any uh, uh, input at it, it will multiply it, and then we'll give you a prediction on the other side. If you leave the talk right now, you can go out to the world claiming that you know machine learning because this is the basic trick at the heart of it. Everything else behind this is just taking it one step later. One step ahead, one step ahead. How to do this with images, how to do this with text, how to do, clean the data so you uh, have, have better models. And then we'll take a few of these steps, uh, hopefully, so you can get a little bit more um, uh, context when you dig deeper into it. So this is, let's say, the second concept of, of the talk here, is the vocabulary of, of machine learning. So we have our features, we have our labels, we have the value we want to predict, we have a, a model that makes predictions, and we have a weight. And this is uh, language that will, will take you from beginning to, to, to the end of, of predictive models. So that was an easy example. This is a much more hard, more difficult task. So this is machine translation. This is kind of like the example that we looked at in the, in the first video. But then the features here are words. And the labels are like sentences, I guess. And the labels are also sentences. And then we use those to predict, let's say, or calculate translations for sentences that we've never seen before. So the same language applies. The difference is the models will be a little different. So to the best of my knowledge, so the last two, three years, uh, these transformer architectures of neural networks have been the leading models for natural language processing. And so I guarantee you with a 95% accuracy that um, whatever they use for interpreter mode is the transformer. And for these t tough or more difficult, more complex language tasks, uh, you would use layers. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, because that's how you can solve that complexity. Because this relationship between these column, this features column, this label column, this is much more complex than just multiplying by 10. A lot of knowledge understanding has to go there if, if you're able to find a model that makes that translation. We'll also talk a little bit about representation. So how do you numerically represent words? How do you numerically represent sentences or images? Uh, because you need to do that uh, if you're good to calculate uh, predictions. Because at the end, it's just you're multiplying weights uh, by whatever inputs that you get. And that's 
the mechanism, if we're to be just very mechanical about what happens inside of a neural network. If you step out of this building today, you're faced with this glorious structure um, in front of you. Who knows what that is? I'm not from London, but um, can somebody name that building? Westminster Abbey. That's Westminster Abbey. Uh, it houses um, the remains of some very famous people. One of the most famous people here is, is Charles Darwin. He says, there's a quote of him saying, I have no faith in anything except actual measurement and the rule of three. So he wasn't big on uh, mathematics. The rule of three is this basic idea that if you have A over B equals C over D, and you, have, you know any three of these, the values of any three, you can tell the fourth. Uh, that's a little bit of what we, we've done there. So we had a, a data set that sort of mapped, uh, that was able, we were able to solve with this. But then, this is not really what we're doing with, with machine learning. We have to take it one step further. And then, you notice the date there, 1882. Three years after that, his cousin, Charles Darwin's cousin, uh, Sir Francis... I'm going to get his last name at, uh, at some point. Uh, he came up, he saw a problem in Darwin's theory of, of, of relativity. Um, Francis Dalton, I think. Galton. He said he, he was looking at how children of tall parents tended to have uh, heights that are closer to the mean of the population. And shorter parents would have children tend to have children that are closer to the mean of, of the population. And so this seemed to be a problem with the theory of relativity because genes are passing through. Why is that, why is that happening? And so to do that, he came up with this figure explaining a little bit about this relationship. And he said, okay, these are the heights of the parents. Uh, this is the mean. This is the average height of the population. There is this tendency of the children's heights to be a little bit closer to the mean of the population uh, than their, their parents. And with this, we can use this line, let's say, to make a prediction. So if we have parents of, let's say, this height, we can use this line to say, okay, we estimate that their children would be um, of this height. This is the basic idea that he called, and we still use this name for it, regression. So this is the basic trick at, at the center of, of a lot of machine learning. Um, we, we're saying everything is, 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 is cutting edge, and that's the name of the track, but then the, the central idea is 1885 regression. So this is a, the, a, the data set that we looked at. It was a very clean model. One maps to 10, two to 20, four to 40. And then to make a prediction, we've drawn this line whose slope uh, of is, is about is 10, right? That's the, the weight that we have. To make a prediction, what do we do? We say, okay, we want to predict three. All right, let's see, three from here, that's our feature. Let's draw a line up to, the, to see where it meets the prediction line. What value of ice cream purchase uh, is there? It's 30, that's the prediction. That's how we use a prediction line. But then real data is never that neat and clean. Real data always has noise. It goes up and down. There's measurement error. It's never that, that clean. So with regression, what we do is that we say, OK, our line doesn't have to go through the, the different lines, but we just need to have the least amount of error in it. And so it's OK to make predictions. We'd have a, a prediction line here, but then the prediction line with the least error, we can make useful predictions using the correlation. And so that's the third concept. With regression, we can predict numeric values using correlations in, in the existing data. So, and this is, I wanted this, this algorithm to think about machine learning as a software engineer. And it goes like this. Do you want to predict a value? Is there a value that is useful for you to predict? Then find features that are correlated with it. And then you can choose and train, quote unquote, we'll talk about what that means, a model that maps the features to the labels with the least amount of error. That's the basic principle of, of regression and how it applies. So 
in the beginning of me trying to learn machine learning, I really wanted this, these goggles to say, okay, how can I turn real world problems into uh, machine learning? Or how can I solve them with machine learning? And this is a general algorithm that, that you can use. And notice that it's, it's correlation, so we never talk about causation. All of machine learning is, uh, at this moment, is just about uh, correlations between, between the features and, and the labels. So we have two example um, models here. We can say each line is a, is a model. I'm going to ask you which one do you think is better. Uh, raise your hand if you think the one on the right is the better model. OK, about maybe 30%. Raise your hand if you think the one on the left is the better model. Zero. Perfect. You, you get the idea. This is the concept. So the least amount of error is better. That's concept number four. Model with less error tends to produce better predictions. Uh, we talked about the length of the model, of, of the errors, or the average of, uh, of the lengths. That's what's called mean absolute error. More commonly, you'll find mean square error. So we take this, this you know, we square of these, um, and then we average them. And that's where we get the, the, the error value that we try to minimize in the training process. So we are not doomed to just creating random lines and seeing which one has less error. If we are to end up learning a little bit about deep learning, uh, the machine learning algorithm that we need to talk about is called gradient descent. And this is the model that starts out with weights and then successively improves the weights and finds a model that makes better predictions. It works kind of like this. Let's break it down into two steps. First step, it picks random weights. And then it just keeps changing the weights to decrease error. And then it does this 10 times, 1,000 times, 5,000 times. Sometimes it runs for days. Some models run for months in training. This is basically training. When we say we're training a model, it's about finding the best ways to, to decrease the error in a model. So step one, step two, repeat until your error stops decreasing. Let's take another closer example. Uh, we had that problem where the weight 10 was, was a pretty good solution to that, to that problem. Uh, how do we come to that number? So we say, OK, step one, let's choose a random weight. Let's start from anywhere. And then we choose, let's say, number two. We calculate three things. We calculate the predictions, the error, and something called the gradient. Based on these calculations, specifically the gradient, so we, we use prediction and error to calculate this value called, called gradient, uh, that gives us a mathematical signal that tells us if you want to reduce the error, you better nudge this number a little bit up or a little bit down, either increase it a little bit or decrease it a little bit. So we update our weight. So the mathematical signal that we got says increase it, so we increase it a little bit, so we're now, our weight is up to five from two. And then we go to step two. We go in with a new weight. We do the exact same thing. We calculate the predictions, the error, and the gradient. We update the weight. And the new weight is now 10. We keep doing this over and over again until our weight stops decreasing. This is how, you know, this simple model is trained. This is how Google Translate is, is, is trained. So we keep repeating until the error stops improving, or uh, maybe just beyond a, a certain threshold. So this mathematical signal comes from this other person who rests in Westminster Abbey. This is a page from a book in 1915 about uh, a picture of, of this person's grave. This is how it looks today if you're to go there and see it. Can anybody, can anybody guess who that is? That is Isaac Newton, exactly. So this is calculus. And this is 300 meters from where we stand right now. So concept number five is model training. When you hear somebody say, says model training, this is all that is. Finding the right weights to allow the model to make better predictions. And using this, this simple algorithm, let's say. Let's talk a little bit about tools. So let's say this is the first step in, in gradient descent. We have our weight, two, and we have 
These are the features that we have in our data set, and we know that we have our labels here. Uh, to calculate a prediction, we just multiply our weight by our features, right? And we get these, these predictions. So we can do it one by one, but more commonly, in, when you're dealing with machine learning, a lot of the times you're just multiplying vectors together and matrices together, so you calculate everything all at once. And so these are the predictions that this model with the weight two would, would predict, right? So a group of people of one person will probably pay $2. We know this is mistaken, but it will improve with time. So now we have our predictions, and we have our actual label that we know uh, how much these people actually paid. We just subtract the two, and then the result is the amount of error in the, in that this model has, has generated. And that is a, another vector. We can, take, we can take absolute value and average these, but this is, this is fine for now. So if you were to tell me five years ago to implement this, I would be doing all kinds of loops to multiply the two by this array of numbers, and then this array by this array. We have the tools to do that now. We don't need to do it um, through loops, um, especially if you haven't used MATLAB in college. I did not, so I, NumPy was the first tool that I knew that can do something like this very conveniently. So the way to do this is we import NumPy as NP. So this is the first tool, general purpose tool uh, in, in the Python uh, ecosystem that a lot of machine learning is, is based on. And if you want to end up doing a lot of deep learning, Python is a little bit unavoidable. You can do a bunch with other languages, but um, it's, it's pretty much the dominant one. So we'll use a couple of examples here. We'll not go too deep, uh, but you can see how, how convenient this can be. So weight is two. We just assign it an a, a integer, a number. It's a variable. And then we can declare these as uh, arrays, numpy arrays, that we pass Python lists to. Okay? So we have features is now a, uh, a NumPy array, and then label is now in NumPy array as well. So how do we calculate predictions? No looping. You just multiply two by this vector. NumPy knows what you want to do. It does something implicit called broadcasting. So it generates, so it says, OK, huh, this is one value, let's say one row. This is three rows. I know what you want to do is multiply this column by a column of two, 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 and so it multiplies them. So that's a, a clever trick called broadcasting with, with some interesting rules that make dealing with, with vectors uh, a lot easier. And so we calculated our predictions in only one line. No looping, no nothing. This is extremely convenient. So how do we subtract these two uh, vectors from each other to calculate the error here? Predictions minus label. That's all there is to it. Extremely convenient. So that's NumPy, the power tool. Uh, TensorFlow rests on top of NumPy. Um, and so whatever you want to do with machine learning, with deep learning, you will always run into NumPy. The second tool uh, that I think is, is very important for, for anybody in machine learning to, to, to work with is Jupyter Notebooks. Um, there is a URL here for this simple notebook that I've published to, to GitHub. And a Jupyter Net notebook is basically a way for you to execute code um, and also document it. So it's a XML file, let's say. Uh, it has text cells and code cells, and you can download it and run it in your own machine if you have that, that, that set up. So you can execute each cell in time. And then if you give it, uh, so this is the code that we just ran through. And if you give it the name of a variable, it will just output whatever is stored in that, in that variable. There's a link at the top here called Open in Colab. And that's the third and final tool that we'll be discussing. So that is a shortcut. So you don't need to install Jupyter and Python and all of these tools on your machine. And we all know how you know, installing environments can, be, uh, can take a little bit too much time. Uh, sometimes. So this is a notebook that you can run completely on the cloud in your browser, no setup, just hit this link, open this notebook, click on the blue link that you'd find saying open in Colab, and then you're, 
you'll just need to sign in with your Google username and password, and then you can just um, uh, execute these cells. Just shift enter executes a cell, or you can just click on, on, on plus here, and then that's this, the second uh, most commonly used tool, or third. So we've, let's look back a little bit to where we've come now. We have five concepts. We have three of the main tools that we can uh, talk about in machine learning. But we have not talked about applications. So when looking for things that are going to have value in commerce, because these will have value over your company, your job, uh, we'll talk about maybe about four of these applications. The first one is credit risk scoring. So uh, that's asking the question of what credit limit to, to, to grant an applicant. So let's say this is a bank. Uh, how much money should they be comfortable lending to me? And so we can go back to that, that algorithm. We have a value, a numeric value that we want to predict. We get a data set that can hopefully help us find an answer to that number. And then in this case, what could be a useful data set of features and labels that can give us um, a prediction of, of a good uh, value? So we can say these are previously approved limits of people that, uh, of loans that the bank has given before. These were approved by humans. So we can say a feature that is probably correlated to limit, to uh, approved limit, is maybe credit score. So that's a very simple algorithm um, or prediction model uh, data set that we can use to train a model that says, okay, grant people l loans just based on their, on their credit score. This is very simplistic, but then you build out and you build out. So we do what we did before. We can graph these. This is the credit score on the x-axis. Y-axis is how much money they were um, approved. Um, we've never seen a 600 before. What do we do? One thing is what we've learned so far is um, apply a simple line. But if we're using only one weight, then we are limiting ourselves to lines that, all, that have to uh, pass through the center, through zero, zero. Uh, but then if we know the line formula, we don't need to do that. We can have more flexibility of adding a, a y-intercept. And that's what we do if we in, uh, introduce one more weight. And so we have these two weights that map to this line that does not have to go through zero, zero. And this line is a much better, let's say, prediction um, line. This is still... Regression, this is the very simplest regression uh, called linear regression. You can take this to the next level and the next level. But then what this does is, okay, to predict how much uh, a loan the bank is willing to give me based on my credit score of 600, we'll do the following. We have two weights, W0. This is also called the bias. And we have W1. And this is X. So we just apply the line formula to this. So we say... 600 times 27 plus, which in this case is minus 9,000, that's the approved credit limit. That's 7,200. That fits on the line there. And so that's, that's the prediction. That's linear regression uh, for credit risk scoring for a very simple one feature column uh, example. So is one column good enough? You always hear that you need more data and more data to create better and better. Uh, predictions. And so it would be useful to, to, to have another column that says, uh, okay, has this person paid their previous uh, loans on time or not? So we can keep adding more and more features uh, to improve our, uh, the prediction of, of our model. And then with every column, let's say, our linear uh, regression model would have uh, more and more weights. So there's concept number six. The more good features we have, the better our model uh, and predictions could become. And notice the emphasis is on good here, uh, because you can throw too many data at your model. They can confuse it at times, or they can bias it. They can have, you can have, you can very easily, we just saw an example with, with, with Vincent in, in the previous talk, where uh, a data set given to a model can generate a racist model, because we just fed it data that is inherently racist. So, uh, while we're on the topic of banking, let's talk about a second application. So, 
fraud detection. So everything in, in, in financial technology has to do with, with fraud detection. So the question we can ask here is, what is the probability that a specific transaction is fraudulent? Let's see what data sets we can use to um, uh, make this prediction. So we have a column of transaction amount. We have another column of the merchant code for this specific merchant. And then we have a label. Notice that the label here is a little different. These are all zeros and one right now, where zero means not fraud and one means fraud. So these are past transactions that happened on, on the system um, that were flagged either as fraud or not fraud. And so we need to make this uh, prediction, let's call it, on, on this transaction. Is it fraud or is it not fraud? So we can do the same thing, but we have a one small addition here. So we'll have weights. We'll have a model that outputs a value, a numeric value. But then we pass that through a very well-defined mathematical function called sigmoid. That's the, called the logistic function. What it does is that it shrinks the output into between zero and one. And then we can use that as a, a measure of, of probability. If we train the model against that data set using uh, a model like this, we can assume that the output of the model stands for probability. And so this RAIN model says, OK, the output it will be 0 0.95. And so the probability that this transaction is fraudulent based on all the other transactions I've seen before and I was trained on is 95%. This is concept number seven. This is what the logistic function looks like. You give it any number, it will map to between one and minus one. This outlooks in, in math, but then it just helps us squeeze numbers and that we can think about probabilities, which you will see is very, very helpful and useful. This is uh, Stripe. So we talked about fraud, fraud detection. This is uh, a little bit of UI on how fraud detection appears to commercial consumers. And so this is a payment of $10 that was blocked due to high risk. So that cleared a certain, let's say, threshold of risk score. And so an application like this would, would, flag, uh, would flag that as, as, as fraudulent. So I would say probably the most lucrative machine learning model is this one. This is the one that makes the most billions for probably anybody on the planet. This is how Google makes 85% of its revenue, advertising. So this is click prediction or click through prediction. So we know how Google works. You go and search for something, you get ads, and you get web pages. If somebody clicks on an ad, Google makes money. So the, the very core of Google's business model is they have ads, they have queries, and they have to match relevant ads to show when somebody is uh, searching for, for a specific query. So let's take an example. Let's say we have six campaigns that people have uh, uploaded or have uh, set up on, on Google AdWords, uh, two for you know, booking.com in London, booking.com in Paris, hotels, let's say. Amazon pages for phones, an Amazon page for shoes, and then two maybe T-Mobile packages, one for postpaid or a contract, um, or, and one for the top-up or prepaid uh, account. Let's say we have a query came in, coming in. They say a user have searched for iPhone. Which of these ads would we show to them if we want to maximize the probability that somebody clicks on it? Because that's how Google makes money. Do we think it's going to be the first one or two, if we're just to think about it ourselves? Probably not, because these are not very relevant to iPhone. It could be phones, but maybe not shoes. So somebody searching for an iPhone could want to buy a phone directly, or they could want to buy maybe a phone with a contract and, uh, let's say, a phone bill with it. So we can think about this. We can flip it into you know, our goggles of how machine learning maps uh, problems. So we can say we have features about the query. We have features about the ad. We input those into a click prediction model. It will do the exact same thing and output a probability through a sigmoid function. And so that probability here, for example, would be 
And so what does Google do before um, they show the result? They will say, OK, hmm, this is the query. Let me score all of my ads on it. So OK, London hotels, Paris, these are 1% click probability. This is 2% click probability. And this is, this is a trained model that we're talking about. So ignore the training process that happens before that for now. So we have these probabilities for these ads, and then we just select the two highest ones, and we show them. And that's how Google makes was it $120 billion in 2018, I think. So we can think about this as these are the features that we can think about how, how that maps to. Uh, so these are previous ads shown to previous people with uh, the, these features about, about the people. And then we can have also columns about the query that was searched. And then the label would be, did the user click this ad or did they not click that ad? And if you have millions and billions of these, you can train models that are very accurate. And so. That's not only how Google makes money, that's also how Facebook makes money, except it's not queries, it's users. And so click prediction makes the vast majority of revenue for both the, the two tech giants, Google and Facebook. This is a, a paper you can, um, about some of the engineering challenges about ad click predictions from Google. Uh, very good read. You can take a picture of the screen and, and look, at, look up the, the paper if, if you'd like. Um, it's, it's fascinating because as, as straightforward as I'm trying or simplistic I'm trying to explain these models from an engineering standpoint, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating challenge. So here we are now. We have seven concepts. We have three tools and maybe three applications that probably make a few hundred billion dollars uh, a year. Let's talk about one more application. This is also very lucrative um, the world, uh, around the world. And this is not just limited to the tech giants. And the, the question here is that if, you have, if you're a company, let's say a subscription company, and you have a marketing budget, um, are you, is it better return on your investment to keep an existing customer or to get a new customer? Who would say keep an existing customer? I have 15 people. Uh, who would say get a new customer? I have I mean, maybe 20 people. It turns out that keeping an existing customer is about you know, five to 10 times cheaper than getting a new customer. And so one of the best marketing, let's say in general, return on investment activities they can do is keep existing customers when you predict that they're gonna leave the service. This is an application called churn prediction. And this is when this is a model to predict when a customer is about to leave the service or not to renew a subscription. And so if you're, a, if you're a phone company anywhere and you have somebody who's on a contract and paying you, let's say, $100 or $200 every month, uh, you would be wise to make sure to pay attention when they, let's say, start using the service a lot less, maybe use a lot less data, because they're probably transitioning to another service. In that case, you might want to have a customer service uh, representative talk to them, see what the problem is, address it, and keep that very delicious subscription revenue coming in. And that's what, what churn prediction uh, is. This is um, an interesting UI that I found of how um, this company, Clavio, close enough, um, visualizes churn prediction. And so this gives you um, customer lifetime value of a, of a specific customer that has spent $54 uh, at this store, let's say. But it's also predicting that the, the value, the, the probability that this person has left the service and will not be back is about 96%. And they visually represent it here with colors. And so for the first, let's say, few months, it was yellow, and then it became really high because we haven't seen this user in, in, in about you know, six months. So churn prediction is, is another very lucrative um, for any subscription service, any telco. They need this talent, either as people, individuals, or maybe consulting companies. So how can we think about this problem? What's a general? Uh, pattern to fit this into what we've discussed so far is that, okay, we have these five um, customers. We have these probabilities for their churn. We have some understanding of how to calculate that. 
we set a certain level of threshold. We say, okay, 50%. Anybody over 50%, I will treat as high probability that that person will, will churn. And if it's lower than 50, then I will say it's not. And that's just a general uh, heuristic, let's say. And so that's the, the, the prediction that we get. So these, based on the probabilities, based on the threshold, these four will remain, this one will churn. This one, the model predicts that this customer will leave the service and will churn. And this is a churn prediction model. <coughs> and so I snuck up on you the eighth concept, which is one of the most central ideas in, in machine learning, classification. So if you have a probability score and a threshold, you can do classification, which classification in this case is we looked at assigning something, a class, of, of between two options, let's say. So, for example, if it's a customer data, you can say, okay, will this customer churn or remain? That's, that's a binary classification. If it's a transaction, we can say, okay, is it fraud? Is it not fraud? That's another classification model. If it's an email message, it's either spam or not spam. If it's a picture, if you've watched the Silicon Valley show, it's either a hot dog or not hot dog. If it's a medical image, you can start talk about some serious things and see some of the latest things in research of cancer, not cancer. If it's text, you can say, is the text talking positively about a thing or negatively, which is sentiment analysis, which is text classification. So um, with that, let me talk a little bit, a couple more concepts that we'll discuss before we wrap up uh, that we'll hit on deep learning a little bit. And then I may, might have lied when I said WordLens is my favorite tech demo of all time. It's probably this one from two years ago. Hello, oh, can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. So this is Google Duplex. I'm sure some of you have seen this. This is a conversation between a human and a machine, a robot, and the human does not realize that they're talking with a glorified chatbot. So I, I was there at Google I.O. and is this, who knows what the Turing test is? Is this, raise your hand if you think that this qualifies as beating the, the Turing test. I did, I did too, right? A human talked to the robot, did not, was not able to tell if that is, is a robot or not, or a machine or not. Um, it turns out that it's not. This is a constrained version of, of the Turing test um, that this, this model is, is able to do. But it, it goes to tell you how machine learning and natural language processing specifically is advancing at a ridiculous pace. And this was 2017, this was three years ago. This area is one of the most highly and rapidly developed uh, areas of research. And so any day now, you're gonna see something that just you know, blow this in, in the water. So this is a model called Google Duplex. We can think about it as a model that has input and output. You put some words in, you get a word out. And this is, you can say the same thing about machine translation models. It's also a model, inputs and outputs. But then what we're oversimplifying here is that there is representation. So we can't just pass words or letters or ASCII, uh, representations to it. We have to find uh, some sort of representation that captures maybe the meanings of behind the words. And this is how we do it. This is how these models do it. This is how Alexa, uh, Siri, uh, uh, Google Translate. The word king here is represented by a list of numbers. This is a list of 50 numbers. This is called an embedding of the word king. So these models represent each word or each token as a list of numbers. And you can represent people or uh, sentences or products, and we'll see how, how that is done uh, as, as lists of numbers. To visualize that a little bit, let me put them all on one row. Let me 
add some color to them. So if they're closer to 2, they're red. If they're closer to minus 2, they're blue. And if they're closer to 0, they're, they're white. So this is the embedding of king. This is the embedding of man. This is the embedding of woman. And you can see that there's a lot of similarities between the embeddings of man and woman. And this is the kinds of uh, word embeddings that you can get from a training, from a model or an algorithm like word to vec And so you can see that just by the similarity between this, these two, this tells you that these numbers are capturing some of the meaning behind these words. So that's concept number six. Word embeddings are my favorite topic in machine learning. Um, I gave a talk about it uh, last year here in, in QCon. Uh, you can go to, to the blog and see. So basically, it's what we use for language, but then we took it out of language and we use it for product recommenders. If you have used Airbnb or Spotify or Alibaba or Tinder, these companies have an embedding of you as a user, and they have, an emb have embeddings of their products. Again, just a list of number uh, that represent you or represent the products. And if you just multiply any two embeddings, that tells you a similarity score. That's an incredibly powerful uh, concept that, that powers a lot of machine translation, product recommendations, um, and you can, you can check more in the, in the blog. That's, that's number nine. Our final application and, and concept is um, text classification. So it builds a little bit on on embeddings. Uh, this is a data set of film reviews. This is a label data set, but I'm not showing you the labels right now. We'll take um, uh, you know, a, a poll. So this, these are all sentences talking about films. And these scores would be either 1 or 0. So 1 would be if it's a positive, uh, 1 would be if it's negative. So who says that this first sentence is saying something positive about the film? So we have about, let's say, 70%. Who says negative? Nobody. OK, what about the second one? Is this a positive sentence? Is it negative? OK. And the last one? It's, it's, it's not super clear all the time, right? We think we're better than these models, but then we're, if we're labeling these, these ourselves, like, like Vincent said, this is not as straightforward as, as you might think. So these are the actual labels, one, zero, and then one, positive, negative, and positive. So this is an application that machine learning, or deep learning specifically, can help us do. And then our next talk, Suzanne, will, talk, will go a little bit deeper into everything outside of the model, how to collect the data, how to visualize it, during, doing something like this, sentiment analysis using this BERT model, some of the latest uh, cutting edge uh, natural language processing models. But we can think about it, just to use the same lingo from concept number two, is that, OK, this is the input to the model. This is the output. It would output either as 1 or 0 based on a probability score that is output by the, by the model. But then, since this is a very complex task, we can't just calculate it in, in one go. So these models go through successive layers. And that's why it's called deep learning. This here is the depth of deep learning. And then using the concept number nine, the, the inputs into this model will be word embeddings, so the specific embeddings of each word in this input. The output would be a sentence embedding, so it would be like 700 numbers that capture this entire sentence. And then that we can use to, to train a, a, a classifier to, to, to classify. And so this is concept number 10. You have the language right now and the vocabulary to think about machine learning, deep learning, you know what features are, you know what labels are, you know what embeddings are, weights, layers. And this sums it up. Uh, this is the last slide here. These are some of the most interesting ideas in, in, in machine learning. You have, hopefully, uh, when you run into them, you would be less intimidated by them because Trust me, you, you got this. The intuition is a lot easier than it might seem if you look at the math behind it. If you want to do more, I advise you go check out fast.ai. They have beautiful videos. The Coursera machine learning uh, course is also very good. And then you can uh, stick around for Suzanne's talk. She will talk a little bit more about this. Thank you very much. <laughs>